Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. All right, want to talk about faith? We have a, we've talked about money for about four or five weeks, so let's talk about faith. I titled this morning, Faith is in Process. You know, faith is faith's not a magic formula. And I think sometimes people treat it like if I do A and B and C, then it's going to equal this. If I, one plus one is two. So if I do the formula, you know, I should get the answer. Faith is more than a formula. It's not a magic formula. And some people treat it that way and it just doesn't work that way. It's actually a process that takes place in you. And sometimes we, we treat it like it's an exterior thing. Faith is an interior thing. And it's a process. And this is really different. In fact, God totally changed my message when I got here this morning. Bob said, oh, I carried a table off from up here. And he said, I thought you were going to use that this morning. I said, well, I was. I silly changed the message. And so <laughs> this is for somebody. And I know it was for me as well. You know, you hear people say, I've done A, you know, which is find the promise in the Bible. I've done B, which is I've made my little confession card so I can quote the word over myself. I've done C, whoop, whoop, praise him for the answer. But I haven't received anything yet. Well, we're going to look at some things that could be wrong and uh, find out that the truth is that the laws of faith don't just change your circumstances, they, they change you. So I, I wrote this down because I wanted to judge myself, but maybe we need to start looking to see if we've changed instead of looking to see if our circumstances have changed. And boy, he hit me hard with that. Uh, in a very loving fatherly way, <laughs> maybe you need to stop looking to see if your circumstances have changed and look to see if you've changed. And we're going to get some answers this morning. I like a father who doesn't just show me I have a problem, but shows me an answer. That's the way he is. Go with me to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to kind of tip our toes into this this morning, and we'll probably have to finish it up next week. But you can't, can't do the story of Abraham in one service, you know. He's, he's chapters. He's chapters long. But let's start off in Genesis 12. He is called the, the father of our faith and a great example of faith for us. Genesis 12, verse 1. You know, don't just jump in the middle here. Let's use our brains when we read the Bible. Abram, there, there's not the children of Israel yet, okay? There's not the, the, the people of Israel yet. There's not a, an established church and covenant with God yet. This is God approaching a man who has no background with God. In fact, he comes from heathens. So when it says God or the Lord said something to Abram, that's like if you were out on this deserted island and never seen a human before and, and the Lord says something to you. He has no background with God. And the trust that this man had to develop, the trust that God had to develop in this man to get him to a place of faith came from zero. Nothing. And so Faith is a process. And he starts it here with Abram. In verse 1 it says, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get, you, get out of your country, and from your kindred, from your father's house, unto a land that I will show you. Well, who are you? It might be the first thought Abram would have. He has no background with God. He, he can't go to church on Sunday morning. This is, this is him and the Lord. And the Lord tells him, I want you to leave everything you know. I want you to get out of the country that you know. I want you to leave the people that you know. I want you to leave your family that you know. And I want you to go into a land that I'll show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now it's going to take something for him to say, Okie dokie. 
let's just pack all these mules up, all these camels up, and let's just go to a place that the Lord is going to show us. This is why he's called the father of faith. This took... I, when I think about this, I, I have trouble wrapping my head around it. And then verse 7, was, God says that he'll give it to Abraham's seed. He'll give the, this land to Abraham's seed. This land he's going to show him. I'll give it to your seed. He didn't have any seed. He has no children. He's 75 years old with no children. So Abram is somewhat obedient to this voice that he hears, and he leaves what he knew. He left what he knew to head towards what God wanted him to know. And this is a big point of today's lesson. You have to leave what you knew to go to what God wants you to know. It's kind of a tongue tungler, but... So he's somewhat obedient. He leaves his country. He leaves his father's house. But he takes Lot with him. He's almost fully obedient. Any, anybody understand that? Almost, I'm almost fully obedient, Lord. I almost did everything the way you said to do it. Takes Lot with him, Lot's his nephew. He wasn't supposed to take Lot with him. He was supposed to leave his family behind. But he takes a little bit of his past with him. He takes a little bit of his identity from his past with him. Takes a little bit of familiarity with him, a little bit of comfort from home with him and that's a mistake as you'll you'll see as we go along but please get the point a part of the process of faith is removing what you knew part of the process of faith is removing what you knew so that you can know what God wants you to know we call that process renewing the mind we talk about that process a lot around here because it is vital to faith if we don't change how we think we'll never have what God has promised us to have and changing how we think is the chore. I mean, we've always thought how we've thought. It took us years to develop how we thought. Now we've got to undevelop what we thought and learn something new. And how many of you at, let's say, my age, 50-ish or older, have ever tried to learn something new? All right, you're at work, they get a new computer system. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a clinic or into a business and the, the workers are in a frenzy. What's going on? Oh, they've given us a new system. Nobody knows how to work this system. Learning something new is not always comfortable. It's not always easy. But how many of you through these generations that those of us who are 50-ish have watched, those systems usually turned out to make our life a whole lot easier and a whole lot better? Just think when you first got a smartphone, how dumb you felt. Now you use it like it's nothing. We've got to learn new things. We've got, we've got to renew our mind to the way God thinks, the way God does things, the way he wants them done. It's called renewing the mind. So let's hold your place if you want to in Genesis and skip over to Romans chapter 12 because this is the best verse I know on the subject of renewing your mind. Getting rid of what you knew so that you can know what God wants you to know. And that doesn't matter if you've only known sickness, but God's promised you health. If you've only known strife, but you want to live in God's peace. If you've only known turmoil in your marriage, but you want to have a good marriage. If you've only known trouble with your children, but you see the promises about children in the scripture, whatever it is, the land that God's promised you, you're not living in it yet. You're going to have to change how you think in order to live in it. It's just as simple as that. We're having to do it all the time. Renew our minds. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. That's your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're going to be changed by changing your mind. You're going to be changed by renewing your mind. That is the only way you're going to be changed. You can't think the same and be different. It's impossible. So we have to force change in our thinking. It, it, nature has plowed rows in our minds. This is the way life has always been. And then God tells us it can be different. 
Getting out of those plowed rows is difficult. Well, we have to make new rows. And that takes effort on our part. And a lot of people don't want to go through the effort. How do I do that? You're going to have to hear what God says about your life to the point where you believe it over what you're living. That's, that's a lot to chew. How much, how much time do I have to spend in the Word? How much time do I have to... How much time do I need to be in praying? How much time... Until you believe God's Word over what your life is showing you. That's how long. Now that can take a little while for some people, and it can take years. For, for Abram, it took years to believe what God said over what he was living. So I can't give you an answer to how long or how much effort. All I can tell you is it's going to take some effort. But I can promise you this, the promised land is good. The benefits of the covenant are good. Walking in faith, the results of it, they're life. Literally life. To many of you, many of you, your, your very living depends on your faith. It's worth it. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed. Be changed. Be metamorphosed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's a great scripture for you to meditate on this week. The truth is circumstances just won't change until you change how you think. And Isaiah 55 is also a good scripture. And I like it because it uses this analogy at the end where it says, instead of. Because you know what life's given you with the way you're living. It's not real hard to figure out what you're going to get if you keep doing what you've been doing. You're living it. You're, you're living proof of what it'll get. But I like Isaiah 55. If you want to turn there, we're going to do quite a bit of reading there. He starts off by saying in verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way. And I know that word wicked could throw you off a little bit because we're not wicked. We're the righteous, right? But you remember and always refer back to this in Numbers 13 when the children of Israel... We're getting ready to go into the promised land. And they went and they sent spies in. And they came back and said, Whoa, there's giants over there. We're not able to take it. God called it an evil report. He called it an evil report. It was the truth. There were giants over there. But the, the lie came in where they said they couldn't take it because God told them they could take it. They believed their circumstances over God's word, which is what we're avoiding today. So he called it an evil report. So when he calls these thoughts wicked thoughts, or let the wicked, it's just anything that doesn't line up with God's word, we've got to change out. His word is God. And so we've got to make it the Lord of our lives. He says, let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Naturally, we don't think like him. Naturally, we don't do like him. But he's fixing to give us a great revelation. He says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and returns not thither, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return into me void. It will accomplish that which I please. It will prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And I always say, that's me. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands, and instead of the thorn will come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that will not be cut off. So if we take his word that he sent, and we place it, and it prospers in us, it grows in us, it develops in us, then instead of what we should have gotten, instead of what our genes should have developed in our bodies, diabetes, whatever, instead of poverty, poverty generation after generation in the system, in the system, in the system. You grow up in the system. You grew up in the system. You're in the system. The next generation's in the system. The next generation's in the system. Something's developed in you. Instead of, 
instead of that, here comes a prospering branch. Because instead of taking what life handed you, you've taken what God has handed you, and instead of the briar. I love that word instead of. Divorce, generation, divorce, generation, divorce, generation, generation after generation, divorce, 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 divorce. The only way we're going to stop that is to renew our minds. And instead of following after generational curses, we're going to have something different. And instead of the thorn will come up the fir tree. Instead of did not just happen. is a process. Instead of is a process of change. You might even say it's a process of exchange. Instead of is a process of exchange. And instead of um, thinking that way, I exchange it for the way he thinks. I do what he tells me to do. And exchanges what I get. His way instead of the way I've always done it. And you hear people say, this is the way I've always done it. Okay, how'd that work out for us? How'd that work out for me? And I don't like the results I'm getting. Something in the equation has to change. At one plus one is going to equal two every single time. If I want a different ending, I have to change something in the equation. That something in the equation today is me. I have to change me. If I want change in my marriage, I have to change me. If I want change in my children, I have to change me. If I want change on my job, I have to change me. If I want change in this community, I have to change me. I am what I can control here. I can't control Bob. Well, kind of I can, but not really. Charlotte can control Bob and if I can get in good with Charlotte, then I have control of Bob. <laughs> when are we going to realize we don't have control of other people? We don't. The faith process is a process in me. I've got to take his thought instead of what I was thinking. So sometimes I, I've tried to catch myself when I start saying, you know, I was thinking... That's a great place to pause right there. What were you thinking, Susan? And maybe you should ask God what he was thinking. Should I do this? Should I do this? Should I buy that? Should I go into that? Should I invest in that? I, what were you thinking? I don't know. Maybe I need to ask God what he was thinking. Because I want his results and not my results. His thoughts and his ways will produce something different. It's called Zoe. Zoe life. It's the God kind of life. The God kind of results. Peace, love, joy, I mean, eternity. His results are so much better than what I'm thinking would get me. Psalm 37 is a very uh, plaqued scripture. <laughs> you see this on everything. But I don't know that we've fully wrapped our minds around it yet. It's beautiful, it's, it's beautiful, but it's, it's way deeper than we take it sometimes. Psalm 37, verse 4. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now, we all kind of like that. Sally, I don't know about you, but I kind of like it because I like to get what I want. <laughs> but that, it's deeper than that. The word's always deeper. He's got layers to his word, and, and you just got to go below the surface. He said, if you delight yourself in the Lord, and that word delight, let's look at it a minute. Uh, when you look it up in the Strong's, it means if you're pliable, if you're soft, if he can work with you. If you'll delight yourself in the Lord, you love him so much that you are willing to be pliable, movable, changeable in his hands. He'll give you desires. Not just give you what you want, but he'll give you desires. What he's going to do is give you his desires. He'll place his desires on the inside of you. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Then commit your way unto the Lord. Trust in him, and he'll bring it to pass. That's a great promise. This is, this is where Abraham stood. He had to be pliable. He stood outside that tent 
with everything he knew behind him. And he had to become pliable, changeable, moldable, movable in the hands of God. And he looked out at that huge plain of earth in front of him, and God said, I'll show you. I don't know about y'all, but, you know, could you show me before I pack? Like, I need to know what to pack. Where are we going? Don't take me on a surprise vacation. I need to know what to pack. God said, no, you leave what you knew, and I'll show you. Oh, faith. He went and packed up everything he had on that word right there. That's pretty pliable. That's pretty usable. That's pretty movable. And he's our example in the faith. So in Genesis 12, 4, it says, Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Yeah, I want the God kind of life. I want the God kind of marriage. I want the God kind of children. I want the God kind of health. I want the God kind of ministry. I want God kind of prosperity. I want the God kind of forgiveness. I want to walk in the God kind of love. I want to live in the God kind of peace. But am I pliable? Because I'm going to have to move to live in it. So I've got to be movable. My thinking has to be movable. My feelings have to be movable. My emotions have to be movable. My hurts have to be removable. So one of the questions we want to ask today is am I willing to step out of the way I've thought into how he thinks? Am I pliable? Because I'm a strong-willed person. Okay, are there any other strong-willed people in here? I feel you, Jordan. Okay, your husband's pointing to you. Our, sometimes our greatest strengths can be our greatest weaknesses. And you get us on the right course, you can't move us off of it, that's good. But you get us on the wrong course and can't move us off of it, that's not good. So we've got to be movable, pliable, changeable, if we're going to step out into the things that God has for us. You know, accepting his thought is the beginning of faith. I want you to think about that. Accepting God's thought is the beginning of faith. Abraham, Abram at the time, had to accept this thought of leaving what he knew and walking into things that he had never walked in before. And though they're desirable, you still don't know how to get there. You don't know what to do. But yet faith requires that first step. Abram packed his bags in verse 5. He headed out. Uh, he wanted to get where God wanted him. He desired the promise. That's great. But he didn't exactly commit the way. Remember that second part that we read a while ago? Oh, great. He'll give you the desires of your heart. That's great. Commit the way is the next words. Commit the way. And boy, that stood out to me today. Commit the way. Commit. Commit's a big word. Commit the way. Zeal and wisdom need to go together. You know, I want what God's got for me. I, I want a great family. I want a great job. I want a, a great life. But zeal and wisdom have to walk hand in hand here. And, and he kind of left some of his wisdom or brought some of his not wisdom with him, if you want to look at it that way, with Lot. He had the zeal to go where God wanted him to go, but he didn't commit the way. I'll remind you, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he'll bring it to pass. Commit the way. I'm going to say commit the how. How to get there. How do we get there from here? How, how are we going to walk in the things that he's... How are we going to get to the promise that he's promised us? We've got to commit the way. We've got to do it the way he said to do it. Not just want it the way he wants us to have it, but to commit the way on how we're going to walk in it. And that's where our obedience comes into play. And that's most of the time we want it. It's the obedient part that we mess up on. His how and God's how didn't match up. There wasn't a huge difference, Andrea. There was not a huge difference in what God said 
And what Abraham did, Abram did just one little thing. Lot. Seem noble. Take your nephew with you. You're going to what God's promised. Seems noble. That's not what God said. Abram's how and God's how had a problem. One little problem. He didn't commit the way. There was a difference between what Abram was doing and the way God said to do it. So our second question for today, first one is, am I pliable? The second one, is there something in the way? On my faith walk, what God's promised me, is there something in the way? Because as soon as Abram separated off from Lot, things changed. Now why? There's lots of, we'll see some things when we read the story. It'll be really hard for me not to get off track. But go to Genesis 13. We'll start reading in verse 11. I'm reading out of the NIV on this one. He's got Lot with him. They're prospering. Things are going pretty good. Uh, Looks like maybe he made good decisions, but he's still not doing things exactly how God said to do them. So in verse 11, uh, they've decided they're going to split up because they're prospering so much that the herdsmen are fighting over the land, over the waters. Their, Their herds have increased so much. And so they've decided they're going to part ways so that they can keep peace. And verse 11 says, so Lot chose for himself. Boy, those words stood out for me. Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company, and Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom, which you all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we can already see some things in Lot, perhaps why God didn't want Lot going with Abram. He pitched his tent towards sin. It's where he wanted to look towards. That's what he wanted to be near. He wasn't in it exactly yet, but he had an eye on it. And he pitched, he pitched his tent that way. So Lot chose for himself. That just stands out to me every time because God didn't choose it for him. Lot chose it for himself. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Now lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west and all that you see I will give you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that no one can count the dust. Then your offspring could be counted. So if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I am giving it unto you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre and Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. God is moving Abram towards the promise from the inside out. From the inside out, Abram doesn't even understand all this. He doesn't understand why God's telling him to go to this area, from that area. But he's looking for what God's saying. Lot is looking for himself. So they have to separate. And you'll find this. And this is a hard truth. If you're going to walk in faith and you're going to walk in the things of God, you need to walk with people who are doing the same. You do. You can minister to those. You can witness to those. Because people get off on this subject of Jesus, friend of sinners. There's even a song about it. But if you go back and you read that scripture, you better read it in context. Because that's not what it says. He ministered to them and brought them with him. And there's a huge difference. If they didn't change their thinking, uh, he didn't hang with them. He didn't. We've got to be careful and make sure that the people that we're with are going in the same direction and for the same purpose that we are. Otherwise, we minister and we, and, and we go. We go God's way. That wasn't today's lesson. Point being, God is moving Abram towards the promise from the inside out. And there's going to be trouble if we move outside before we're ready inside. You know, if, if you want to get married, that's noble. That's godly. That's, that's a promise from God for you to have a godly home. But if you move on the outside towards marriage before you're ready on the inside, there's trouble. 
You let God move you from the inside towards that marriage. And there's a lot of us in here to say a big happy amen right there. If you want to have children, that's great. That's noble. That's a godly promise. Your children will be taught of the Lord and great will be the peace of your children. But you better be moving inward before you move outward or there's going to be trouble. You want that great job, that great house, that great life, that's great. Those are promises of God. There's great things that he's promised you. He's promised you prosperity, but if you move on the outside before you're ready on the inside, there's going to be trouble. Faith is a process. This is why faith is a process. Faith is developing you. It's developing in you. It's changing you. This is changing Abram. He doesn't even know how it's changing him, but God's getting him in place to receive the promise. And sometimes I think we despise the process. And I'm not talking about God putting you through bad things. I'm talking about mature, you maturing. You learning to be obedient. You learning to listen to his voice. You learning to be in the right place at the right time. Hearing him, being obedient to him. It's, it's crucial. It, it's not read the scripture and there it is. Unless you've developed in you to trust and to to believe him. Abram is building a relationship with God. He's coming to a place where he can trust him, where he does trust him. And that's all part of faith, isn't it? Faith is a process. It's not just out here in the circumstances, but you're developing on the inside. You know, patience comes into play in faith. Faith and patience are running partners. So listen to him. Ask yourself, am I being pliable? Are these desires of him and am I willing to be changed to where he can fulfill these desires in me? And if you're not getting the results you want, then, then at some point we've got to look at ourselves and say, okay, I'm, I'm pliable. I'm movable. But is there something in the way? Is, is there something in the process that I'm missing? That I am, have I done it the way he said to do it? See, there's promises of prosperity, but there's a way. There's promises for a great home, but there's a way. There's promises for peaceful children, but there's a way. And we need to make sure we, we're not just pliable, but we know the way. And that obedience is key. We'll continue this next week. Y'all can stand. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.